Ani Jayek, welcome back to our Braiding Sweetgrass book club series. And I think this is our episode 13. So um, we are getting there. Hope you had a wonderful week. The weather has been gorgeous. So I'm hoping that you're enjoying that and that you're ready to come together and have a great book club. So as always, before I get started, I like to smudge, I burn, sage, sweetgrass, cedar, and tobacco sema. Um, but whatever your culture or whatever you do to help yourself get centered, um, to be in the moment so we're not multitasking so that we can be all together and not worrying about groceries or kids or homework or business or whatever. Um, so I smudge, make sure I have some water or tea. Um, tonight it is a tea night. So do whatever works for you to get centered and ready. And now we're gonna take just two big deep breaths together um, and we'll get ready to go. I like to sit cross-legged, but some people like to have both feet on the ground, do whatever works for you. There's no right or wrong way here. So take a big deep breath in, we'll take two and then we'll get started and go. And let's begin. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So this week, um, we are on page 254 chapter putting down roots. Um, I love the way that she started this out. Robin starts this out um, talking about a woman bending down planting and she's um, speaking in Mohawk. Um, and then she fast forwards 400 years and she's the one planting and she's planting sweet grass. And I just loved the parallel of both of those and it was brilliant how she put that in um then she goes on to talk about um the mohawk land um, which is now upstate new york um and she says the once dominant culture of the great Haudenosaunee or the iroquois confederacy was reduced to patchwork of small reservations the language that first gave voice to ideas like democracy women's equality, and the great law of peace became an endangered species. Um, I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, um, and so many of us were taught in school that our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence, but mainly the Constitution, um, was based on Greek government, and that is incorrect. Um, Thomas Jefferson, who actually um, really, really hated the Potawatomi, my tribe, um, kind of stole the idea of, uh, of the Constitution from the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois. Uh, they had the style of government forever. And so our Constitution and the government for the United States of America and many democracies across the world now all came from the Haudenosaunee the Iroquois Confederacy. So that's something we all need to unlearn and then relearn. Um, so let's go on. I just thought, um, I love that she brought that in. Also, my tribe as well as the Haudenosaunee and the, and, uh, the Mohawk, uh, if someone, so if there was a dispute, if there was some kind of drama or someone had done something really wrong and you needed some sort of counsel, they had, a council called the 13 grandmothers, the council of the grandmothers. And there was 13 grandmothers and they would decide what to do. They would decide if they were going to war. Uh, the 13 grandmothers would handle disputes over everything. Uh, so it was really the women who made sure that things were fair and right and correct and drama free. And um, I often think how things would be now if disputes, whether it's family or just within the community or whatever, or worldwide were handled by the 13 grandmothers and just stop dealing with judges and juries and police or whatever. Let's bring back the 13 grandmothers and let's listen to them. Okay, moving on. 
Okay, Robin goes on to say, Mohawk language and culture didn't disappear on their own. Forced assimilation, the government policy to deal with the so-called Indian problem, shipped Mohawk children to the barracks at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where the school's avowed mission was kill the Indian to save the man. Braids were cut off and native languages forbidden. Girls were trained to cook and clean and wear white gloves on Sunday. The scent of sweet grass was replaced by the soap smells of the barracks laundry. Boys learned sports and skills useful to a settled village life, carpentry, farming, and how to handle money in their pockets. The government's goal of breaking the link between land, language, and native people was nearly a success. But the Mohawk call themselves the Kinekuha, and I don't know if I pronounced that right, um, but it means the people of the flint. And flint does not melt easily into the great American melting top pot. I loved the way she, she put that. Flint does not melt easily into the great American melting pot. How profound um, and how true. The Mohawk, uh, the people of the Flint really fought hard and the longest because they were one of the first, um, besides the Wampanoag, the Mohawk were one of the first contacted um, and they fought and they continue to fight to this day really hard for their land. Um, and then as she explained, the people of the Flint. So for those of you that don't know, so native tribes, our names were pretty much named for location, for where we were, because we were all one people, but different communities, different tribes, different bands. So like for example, my tribe, the Bodewatomi, the Potawatomi, um, that means the people of the fire. So our responsibility when we came to council was the Potawatomi would bring the sacred fire. So we're called Bodewatomi, which means bringers of the fire. Um, and the, the Mohawk, that just means people of the Flint. So it's a lot of like responsibilities of what you did as a community, where you were located, um, there's many, many other examples, but I'm kind of having a brain fog right now. Um, but you can look it up and it's, it's all about location. It's, we don't have like any crazy names or anything. It's about what we were known for, what we contributed to, or just the land we were. And we always, if we, like if we're, so my people were known as the duck people because we knew all the waterways. So let's say we're cruising around on our canoes and we come into um, like Shawnee territory or Kickapoo territory, we would always say we were, we're Bodewatomi, we're people of the fire, and um, we acknowledge that this is your land, Kickapoo land, and blah, blah, blah. So we would always introduce ourselves like that. So like, I'm Kasautosot, helping woman, I'm Bodewatomi, people of the fire, and we acknowledge that this is Kickapoo land or Shawnee land. Um, right now, I would do a land acknowledgement to the Eastern, um, to Salki, the Eastern Cherokee and the Shawnee because of where I am. And so that's how land, igno land acknowledgements have always happened. This isn't a new liberal concept. Land acknowledgements have always, always happened. And it's a, t a type of respect. Um, and I wish we would all do that today. Like we're just passing through, but we acknowledge this is your land and we're just coming on through. By the way, this is my name and this is who I am. Um, I just think the world would be a lot nicer place if we did that. So I have, a, um, I'm starting to get into the habit of doing land acknowledgements. Whenever I do a talk or a speech, I'll do a land acknowledgement for not only the ancestral home, but also if there's current tribes there to this day. So I'll acknowledge the land first, then the ancestral land, and then the people who are there tribal today and it can get kind of messy because of removal but you can figure it out and the more you do it the more easier it is and the more um great you feel for doing so so it's a it's a habit that i'm really happy to um to continue so anyway soapbox um i do that quite often i have a lot of side notes <clears throat> okay so robin goes on to say over the top of the waving grasses, I can see two other heads bent to the soil. So she's been planting sweet grass, right? 
The shiny black curls tied back with a red bandana belong to Daniela. She pushes herself up from her knees and I watch her tally the number of plants in her plot. 47, 48, 49. Without looking up, she makes notes on her clipboard, slings her bundle over her shoulder and moves on. Daniela is a graduate student and for months we have been planning for this day. This work has become her thesis project and she's anxious about getting it right. On, gra on graduate school forms, it says that I'm her professor, but I've been telling her all along that it is the plant who will be her greatest teacher. I love the humbleness of Robin. I love how, I mean, she's out there with her student, um, digging and counting and doing this with her. What, what other, there's no greater way to teach than doing. Um, right? So I just think that is amazing. And then she often reminds her students, I'm not the teacher, the plants are. And I just, that's so humbling for me and um, refreshing to hear. You know, so many times uh, professors are put on this pedestal, which they, they are due respect for sure. Um, but in some way they're put on this pedestal as if their learning has stopped, that they there's no need for them to learn anymore. So I just love that acknowledgement from Robin. Now I wanna read this next part, it's on 256. So um, Robin has a friend, a Mohawk friend, who's helping them um, plant and she's just as excited as they are. And um, Robin says, in rows of seven, for seven generations, we are putting roots in the ground welcoming the sweet grass back home. Despite Carlisle, despite exile, despite a siege 400 years long, there is something, some heart of living stone that will not surrender. I don't know just what sustained the people, but I believe it was carried in words. Pockets of the language survived among those who stayed rooted to place. Among those remaining, the Thanksgiving address was spoken to greet the day. Let us put our minds together as one and send greetings and thanks to our Mother Earth, who sustains our lives with her many gifts. Grateful reciprocity with the world, as solid as a stone, sustained them when all else was stripped away. In the 1700s, the Mohawks had to flee their homelands in the Mohawk Valley and settled at Aquasini, straddling the border with Canada. Teresa comes from a long line of Aquasini basket makers. Um, I love that Robin also reminds us, you know, she'll gives us the, you know, the sense of hope and fulfillment when she's talking about planting the sweet grass in seven generations but then she gets real and she reminds us of the removal and all of the genocide but then comes back again to hope like so we will we will never forget what happened and we'll but we will never forget where we came from and we will keep going forward because that's the way the cycle is and we know that everything is a cycle everything is a circle uh, so I love the way that Robin presents that, um, you know, she never forgets where we've come from um, and she gives credit where it is due and the fight that everyone has gone through and survived. She keeps it very real and I really appreciate that. Now this next um, paragraph, I want to know what you think about it. The marvel of a basket is in its transformation, its journey from wholeness as a living plant to fragmented strands and back to wholeness again, as a basket. A basket knows the dual powers of destruction and creation that shape the world. Strands, once separated, are rewoven into a new whole. The journey of a basket is also the journey of a people. Now, that paragraph for me is so deep on so many levels. She talks about the, de de the deconstruction of a plant, whatever you're using to make that basket, whether it's um, birch bark or 
um, it strands from flaxseed or whatever it is that you're making your basket with, you have to deconstruct it and then you put it back together. And native people have done the exact same thing. And I'm not just talking about native people from the Americas. If you look worldwide, indigenous people are waking up from all over and they're becoming whole again. They're taking their defragmented parts, their defragmented culture, and they're gathering them and they're putting them back together to make them whole into something that's going to be marvelous. And that's what I got from that paragraph. But I'd like to know what you think. Drop what you think in the comments and we will discuss. Okay, on page 258, I want to read this to you. <clears throat> when a language dies, so much more than words are lost. Language is the dwelling place of ideas that do not exist anywhere else. It is a prism through which to see the world. Tom says that even words as basic as numbers are imbued with layers of meaning. The numbers we use to count plants in the sweetgrass meadow also recall the creation story. Enska, one. This word invokes the fall of Sky Woman from the world above, all alone, Enska. She fell toward the earth, but she was not alone, for in her womb a second life was growing. Tikeni, there were two. Sky Woman gave birth to a daughter who bore twin sons, and so there were three, Ahisen. Every time the Hadanuse count to three in their own language, they reaffirm their bond to creation. Um, I love that for so many reasons because we know that, so for, for my people, the number one thing is land. We're connected to our land. Without our land, we don't have anything. And that's for so many reasons. Um, I mean, your land is what sustains you. It's your mother, it's your father, it's everything. So without that connection to land, like Robin has been saying throughout this whole book, you're lost. But then with the language, language is your connection to land. It's how you do the honorable harvest. It's how you pray. It's how you talk with respect to one another. So your language is everything especially when your language is also your, with a lack of a better word, religion. Uh, everything in indigenous language is, is culture, is ceremony. So without that language, we lose ceremony. And I think that's why those who wanted us removed, I believe that's one of the reasons, first remove the land, because that's everything to us and second remove our language because then we couldn't pray and they knew exactly how to try to to slaughter us remove the land remove the language and then the Indian problem will be gone so I love that so many nations are bringing their their language back um, for example my tribe the Bodhiwatami is just one example um, we have a huge language department now with online classes. There's an app, there's an online dictionary, and our language director is super involved. Justin Neely, he is the best. And he is a lot like Robin where he's like, I'm learning at the same time, um, let's learn together. And he has been the best advisor and mentor, and he's been great. And so many other tribes around North America are doing this. We have to hold on to our language. I think that's also why COVID um, has hit us so hard. That's why so many Native nations really took it seriously because COVID was targeting um, our elders and our elders are our knowledge keepers. They're the ones that know the language. And if you saw all the nations, they all just like surrounded their elders to keep them safe. And unfortunately, we did lose quite a few elders. I think in... With Ojibwe, you know, the Potawatomi are a sister tribe to the Ojibwe. Um, we did lose two, as far as I am aware of, I could be totally wrong, but two um, fluent speakers of Ojibwe, which there isn't a whole lot of fluent speakers. Like, I, I know some words and I know some terms, but 
fluently. I have a ways to go. Anyway, back to my point is um, being able to count to three. So many people would like, you can count to three, but can you speak it in your indigenous language? And does it connect you to the land and to your people the way that it does um, for, in this case, for the Mohawk? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay. Now, I, I really hope you're having fun with this chapter. She is talking to an elder um, of the Mohawk who is, his goal is to go back home. So he's purchased 400 acres in New York and it's open for members of his tribe and they're bringing their culture back, um, undoing the, the damage done at residential school. Um, so Robin is explaining that, and I want to read this part. It's really important. It's on page, uh, 261. The history of the plants is inex inextricably tied up with the history of the people. See, I do so much reading sometimes I forget how to pronounce words. So, so just bear with me. With the forces of destruction and creation. At graduation ceremonies at Carlisle, the young men were required to take an oath. I am no longer an Indian man. I will lay down the bow and arrow forever and put my hand to the plow. Plows and cows brought tremendous changes to the vegetation. Just as Mohawk identity is tied to the plants the people use, so it was for the European immigrants who sought to make a home here. They brought along their familiar plants and the associated weeds followed the plow to supplant the natives. Plants mirror change in culture and ownership of land. Today, this field is choked by a vigorous sward of foreign plants that the first sweet grass pickers would not recognize. Quack grass, timothy, clover, daisies. A wave of invasive purple loosestrife threatens from along the slow. To restore sweetgrass here, we'll need to loosen the hold of the colonists, opening a way for the return of the natives. That's been a hard one because sweetgrass is, was the grass that was here and it was in abundance along waterways. And you, you can't find it anymore. It's really, really rare. Um, so the fact that so many people are out there replanting it is amazing but at the same time you're having to fight against the invasive species and you can take that in more ways than one can't you um but it's just we forget how much damage is done not just to the people but the ecosystems um and without the sweet grass uh, we lose so much culture because so many stories are around the sweet grass. It's a sacred, one of the sacred four is how grandmothers teach their granddaughters and their da daughters. So we just have to be more careful with what we bring in, what we allow in and, um, how we take care of, uh, what's already here in more ways than one. Okay, this next part gets a little deep, but it's necessary. On page 263. When I was young, I had no one tell me that. Like the Mohawks, Potawatomi people revere sweetgrass as one of the four sacred plants. No one to say that it was the first plant to grow on Mother Earth, and so we braid it, as if it were our mother's hair, to show our loving care for her. The runners of the story could not find their way through a fragmented cultural landscape to me. The story was stolen at Carlisle. And I can relate to this um, because my mom was very, um, she would share her knowledge in, in kind of bits and pieces. As she became older, she shared a little bit more. Now, my grandfather, who I believe was a residential school survivor, uh, I, I believe it's been hard to find any evidence um, that like is a smoking gun. But from what I've been able to gather in a short story, he was um, taken to Sacred Heart in Kansas, Kansas, in Kansas City, Kansas, um, just outside of Topeka. Anyway. They're not the same after, and Grandpa, every once in a while, would tell us a story 
about our culture, but then would immediately get very closed lipped and almost look scared. And that also tells me again, residential school survivor. Anyway, um, so a lot of the knowledge that I have gained over the years, it has been through other elders, other aunties of the tribe um, to help me learn just because there's so much lost. Um, and I, she goes on to say that the work that indigenous people like this, um, like Tom is doing is undoing Carlisle. And I love that. And hopefully as I, hopefully I can gain more information about Sacred Heart in Kansas about my grandfather, I can undo Sacred Heart uh, to make it those stories okay and necessary again and safe. That's the key word, safe. Okay, moving on. Tom walks over to the bookshelf and chooses a thick red volume to lay on the counter. The Indian Industrial School, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, 1879 to 1918. In the back of the book is a list of names, pages and pages of them. Charlotte Bigtree, Mohawk. Stephen Silverheels, Oneida. Thomas Medicine Horse, Sue. Tom points to show me his uncle's name. That's why we're doing this, he says. Undoing Carlisle. My grandfather is in this book too. I know. Running my finger down the long columns of names and stop at Asa Wall. Potawatomi, a pecan picking Oklahoma boy, just nine years old, sent on train across the prairies to Car Carlisle. His brother's name, his brother's name comes next, Uncle Oliver, who ran away back home. But Asa did not. He was one of the lost generations, one who never could go home again. He tried, but after Carlisle, he didn't fit anywhere. So he joined the army. Instead of returning to a life among his family in Indian territory, he settled in upstate New York, not far from this riverbank, and raised his children in the immigrant world. At a time when cars were novel, he became a superb mechanic. He was always fixing broken cars, always mending, seeking to make things whole. I think that same need, the need to make things whole, propels my work an ecological restoration. I imagine his knife nose profile leaning over the hood of a car, his brown hands wiped on greasy rags. During the depression, people flocked to his garage. Payment, if there was any, was often in eggs or turnips from the garden. But there were some things he couldn't make whole. He didn't talk much about those days, but I wonder if he thought of the pecan grove in Shawnee where his family lived without him, the lost boy. The aunties would send boxes for his grandchildren, moccasins, a pipe, a buckskin doll. They were boxed away in the attic until her Nana would lovingly take them out to show us, to whisper, remember who you are. I suppose he achieved that when he had been taught to want a better life for his children and grandchildren. The American life was taught to honor my mind thanks him for his sacrifice, but my heart grieves for the one who could have told me stories of sweet grass. All my life I have felt that loss. What was stolen at Carlisle has been a knot of sorrow. I've carried like a stone buried in my heart. I'm not alone. That grief lives on in all the families of those whose names appear on the pages of that big red book. The broken link between land and people, between the past and the present, aches like a badly broken bone still unknit. Sometimes I swear Robin is telling me my story. And it's hard to not get emotional because I, that is how I feel. She put it out on, she, she made my feelings and my experience into words on paper. Um, and it's beautiful and it's sorrowful 
and necessary. We need these stories. And I can't wait until we can have gatherings again so I can see Robin and give her a giant chimigwitch um, and have that heart to heart conversation of gratitude. Um, because this book has done so much to not just reconnect me, but heal that part of me of that ancestral trauma that we all deal with, whether we recognize it's there or not. Okay, I want to read this too. It's on page 265. So they've returned to Carlisle, the barracks of Kyle, in Carlisle, uh, Pennsylvania. It, it almost seems like they're trying to do some kind of... <clears throat> Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, reparation. Um, but they're doing it kind of like, we acknowledge that this happened, but we're going to have a party kind of feeling. Um, at least that's what I'm getting from it. But I want to read this paragraph. Stolen children. Lost bonds. The burden of loss hangs in the air and mingles with the scent of the sweet grass reminding us that there was a time when all the peach stones threatened to turn black side up. One could choose to assuage the grief of that loss by anger and the forces of self-destruction. But all things come in twos, white peach stones and black, destruction and creation. If the people give a mighty shout for life, the peach stone came game can have a different ending for grief can also be comforted by creation by rebuilding the homeland that was taken the fragments like ash splints can be rewoven into a new whole and so we are here along the river kneeling in the earth with the smell of sweet grass on our hands Okay, so now we are moving on to the next chapter, Umbilicaria, the belly button of the world. So uh, Umbilicaria is talking about, I believe, um, this sort of lichen. Um, let me see if I can find, of course I can't find it now. Maybe, can, okay, here we are. I come here sometimes just to be in the presence of such ancient beings, the sides of the boulder are festooned with Umbilicaria americana. It's a raggedy ruffles of brown and green, the most magnificent of northeastern lichens. So it's a form of lichen, um, that like really gorgeous blue-green lichen. Okay, so now I'm on page 269, um, starting at the bottom. I once heard a Navajo herbalist explain how she understands certain kinds of plants to be married due to their enduring partnership and unquestioning reliance on one another. Lichens are a couple in which the whole is more than the sum of its parts. My parents will celebrate their 60th, wow, their 60th wedding anniversary this year and seem to have just that kind of symbiosis a marriage in which the balance of giving and taking is dynamic, the roles of giver and receiver shifting from moment to moment. They are committed to an us that emerges from the shared strengths and weaknesses of the partners, an us that extends beyond the boundaries of coupledom and into their family and community. Some lichens are like that too, their shared lives benefit the whole ecosystem. I love that she compared that to her parents and their successful re relationship, that it's uh, always in us. Um, my husband and I, we, wow, next month we'll be married um, 26 years. We weren't able to do anything for our 25th because of COVID and we still won't be able to do like travel anything. We might be able to go out to dinner. I don't know. Um, but 26 years is like a small shadow compared to 60 years. I can only imagine. Um, and we have definitely had, um, we've had marvelous ups, but we have had some very deep downs too. In fact, we were separated for a couple of years, um, towards the beginning, but we were married young. We were married at 20. So yeah. Um, 
but it is that kind of like at some moments like I'm doing great I'm on fire and I am making sure everything is in order and giving him what he needs and then there's some moments where I'm out and about like just done um, there was a point in my life after my mom died um, I was diagnosed with severe PTSD and severe depression and it was it was bad um, brain fog like I I almost felt like I had early Alzheimer's because I couldn't, the memory was just gone. Um, and I completely shut down um, in so many ways. And it took him a while, but he really, um, he made sure I got the help I needed and he never left my side and he was wonderful. Uh, and then I realized there's like, he's being treated for depression now. Um, and so the depression is, I don't want to give out too much of his information. That would be really mean, not a good wife thing to do. Um, but he has been able to find himself in this new, I don't know, this new adventure we're going on and as far as mental health. And it's made us even stronger. So it's kind of like that. We just go back and forth. But we always have on our mind the other. Like I never make decisions without thinking about him or the family and I believe he does the same thing. And I think that's the secret of a good relationship is just everything you do, everything you say, uh, every decision you make, it is based on the us, not just for me. Sometimes we slip, of course, like the other, we have baby goats that were just born and I got so excited. I was like, whoever does this, they can name a goat. And I didn't think of him. And then the next day I felt like a jerk for not doing that. So marriage is, a, you know, celebrate those wins and those ups. But when they're down, and you will have those downs, it's just the way it is. Just hang on. Hang on and remember the respect and the love that you have for your significant other. And because the ups will come again. That's my advice. Um, but that's just from a 20, 25, 26 year marriage compared to 60 years of marriage. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so now I'm on page 275. She explains a lot about the lichen um, and the relationship they have to each other and with their surroundings to survive and thrive. Um, so she spent a lot of time with that, which was really, really cool. Um, but now I'm moving on to page 275. These ancients carry, carry teachings in the way that they live. They remind us of the enduring power that arises from mutualism, from the sharing of the gifts carried by each species. Balanced reciprocity has enabled them to flourish under the most stressful of conditions. Their success is measured not by consumption and growth, but by graceful longevity and simplicity, by persistence while the world changed around them, it is changing now. While lichens can sustain humans, people have not returned the favor of caring for lichens. Umbilicaria, like many lichens, is highly sensitive to air pollution. When you find umbilicaria, you know you're breathing the purest air. Atmospheric contaminants like sulfur dioxide and ozone will kill it outright. Pay attention when it departs. That's really important. I did not know that. So that's great, great information. So, so I just want to finish with this last paragraph on page 276, and then I want to know your thoughts. Rock tripe, oak leaf lichen, navel lichen. I'm told that umbilicaria is known in Asia by another name, the ear of the stone. In this almost silent place, I imagine them listening to the wind, to a hermit thrush, to thunder to our wildly growing hunger. Ear of stone, will you hear our anguish when we understand what we have done? The harsh post-glacial world in which you began may well become our own unless we listen to the wisdom carried in the mutualistic marriage of your bodies. Redemption lives in knowing that you might also hear our hymns of joy when we too marry ourselves to the earth. I want to say that one more time. 
Redemption lives in knowing that you might also hear our hymns of joy when we too marry ourselves to the earth. I think that is a beautiful sentence to end on and something to ponder and think about. Um, we all can do something. It's so hard for us to do it all, but if we change little by little our, our carbon footprint, um, the way we tend to the earth, our relationship with the earth, the language of the land, um, I really think that's what it is, the language of the land, and we respect that and honor it. I really think we can bring ourselves back from the brink. And I'd like to know what you think. So I really appreciate your time with me. This book club has saved me through COVID and I hope it's done for the same, the same for you. Um, I ha I post this on Facebook and Instagram, um, a little bit on TikTok, not so much on TikTok, and then YouTube. And I love hearing everybody's um, words about this. Um, YouTube is probably the easiest because I can post the whole video on YouTube. And so we, I, I'm really appreciative of the conversations that we have. Uh, it's kept me in connection with other humans and it's helped me to keep my brain expanding and me learning. I still have so much to learn and I just wanna soak it all up. So I appreciate you helping me along my journey and I hope that in a way I'm helping you along your journey as well uh, because it is that reciprocity. Um, that relationship and I really really love that and I really appreciate you so until next time take care and we'll see you later Bama P. for every indigenous author Monday video that I put out I am dedicating it to the one shelf project put on by Gadakana Gadakana is an indigenous organization a 501c3 nonprofit tax deductible organization that provides books in their local libraries that are actually accurate, historically accurate, and by indigenous authors, both fiction and nonfiction. And their goal is to at least have a shelf dedicated to indigenous accurate information in their local libraries. They can only do this with help through donors and they need your help. I will put the link down here so please check them out the one shelf project another organization near and dear to my heart gedakana <laughs>